Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we welcome you all to uh, another round of uh, Center of Excellence program. Uh, today we'll be discussing on cardiology and neurology. I have uh, Professor Guleria to uh, give his introductory remarks, and after that we'll have the presentations by Dr. Deepthi from cardiology and Professor Padma, Chief of Neurosciences Center, followed by Panel Deshi. So may I request you to give your introductory remarks. Thank you and uh, good afternoon to everyone who has uh, logged into this uh, COVID uh, Center of Excellence program. Uh, this has been something that we at the All Institute of Medical Sciences have now been doing regularly for quite some time. And today we have a very interesting topic for discussion, which is basically COVID-19 and cardiology and COVID-19 and the brain or neurology. I think uh, both these topics are very, very important because as we are learning more and more about COVID-19, we are realizing that it has a significant degree of extra pulmonary manifestations, which at times get missed. And this leads to delay in diagnosis and sometimes it also leads to improper treatment because we don't really um, diagnose or pick up the extra pulmonary uh, manifestations which need treatment within their own right. If you look at the cardiac involvement, we can look at uh, COVID-19 in people who have pre-existing cardiac illness and we know that the individuals with pre-existing cardiac illness or uh, even hypertension are at uh, risk of more severe disease and that's something that is a cause of concern. There's also an issue of treatment therapies which we are giving both for the cardiac disease and for COVID-19 because we know that both of them are a little bit of uh, debate in them. ACE inhibitors, ARB as far as treatment for heart disease is concerned and the issues of giving various drugs which can actually lead to arrhythmias uh, including hydroxychloroquine. The third more important part as far as cardiac disease is concerned is regarding the direct or indirect effect that COVID-19 has as far as the heart is concerned. It can, it's COVID-19, we all know, causes a huge cytokine storm, an inflammatory response in the body. It also causes a pro-thrombotic state, and this indirectly can affect many systems, including the heart and the brain. It also has a direct effect on the heart leading to myocarditis. It can affect uh, other uh, um, areas in the heart leading to significant uh, problems in per se because of its uh, direct cytotoxic effect. And then there's a third, the other challenge that we have is of managing patients who come with acute coronary syndrome, uh, ST elevation, myocardial infarction, and are COVID positive. How do we manage these patients in terms of interventions as far as the heart is concerned? As far as the brain is concerned, I think, again, this is a very, very important area because the neurological manifestations, again, can be because of the systemic effects that uh, COVID-19 cause, the pro-inflammatory, the pro-thrombotic stage, which has an effect on the uh, central nervous system itself, but also the cy direct cytotoxic effect that the virus can have on the nerve cells itself. And that is also something which is now that we're realizing more and more 
about the virus actually reaching the brain and causing its effect. Also, the, the neurological effects can be very varied from simple effects like loss of uh, uh, the sense of uh, smell and loss of taste to headache to more severe effects like uh, stroke or encephalitis, the Gulenberry syndrome. So there is a vast variation as far as the neurological manifestation is concerned. And keeping in mind that this is infectious disease, how do we go up about managing patients who have neurological manifestation? And I think the neurology department here has done a lot of work as far as teleconsultation is concerned. And they were already working on a telestroke model, which I think could be very well used as far as uh, COVID-19 and stroke is concerned. So there is a, a lot of learning both as far as COVID-19 and the brain is concerned uh, and also COVID-19 as and the heart is concerned. And I can see that we have uh, eminent uh, speakers and uh, 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 faculty for the panel discussion. We have uh, Dr. Deepthi who will be talking on COVID-19 and cardiology and Professor Padma who will be talking on COVID-19 and the brain. And then a, a very good uh, group of people in the, on the panel who would be taking your questions. So without wasting much time, I will hand over uh, the uh, proceedings to Dr. Amboj, and I'm sure you will have a very uh, enriching talk uh, and discussion as far as these two areas are concerned. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your introductory remarks and uh, putting things in perspective. So we'll start first with the presentation by Dr. Deepthi on COVID and uh, cardiology. Can we have the slides? Or... Good evening, one and all. Uh, today, I'll be discussing about the cardiovascular manifestations of uh, uh, COVID-19. As we all know, this rapidly evolving pandemic has now uh, caused more than 35 million confirmed cases and over uh, 1 million deaths worldwide. In India alone, we have had more than 6.75 million cases and over 100,000 confirmed deaths. The cardiotropism of this uh, virus can be explained by the mechanism of entry into the host cell. The virus has surface attachment proteins called spike protein, which after uh, activation by a transmembrane serine protease, uh, attaches to the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor. This receptor is the primary portal of entry into the host cell and apart from increased expression in the lung parenchymal cells, particularly alveolar cells. This uh, receptor is also found in abundance in myocardial cells. The various cardiovascular manifestations that have been described so far in the literature since the outbreak. I'm not able to hear. So a lot of reports have been uh, published regarding myocardial injury in COVID-19. These uh, uh, reports have been either due to acute coronary syndromes or due to myocarditis as we will be discussing later. There has been a more than 50% increase in the incidence of out of hospital cardiac arrest which closely mirrors the cumulative incidence of the infection, uh, the uh, cases itself. Uh, COVID-19 is also associated with increased incidence of venous thromboembolism and cardiac arrhythmias. In the pediatric population, a speci very specific Kawasaki-like multi-system inflammatory disease has been described. I'll be discussing about each of these manifestations in detail in the next 10-15 minutes. Myocarditis is traditionally defined as an inflammatory disorder of the myocardial cells, which is which which the gold standard for the diagnosis of which is histopathological demonstration of infiltration with inflammatory cells leading to myocardial injury. And all this should happen in the absence of an ischemic cause. It has been this, the most common identifiable cause of myocarditis is viral, and in the past, the other coronaviruses like MERS-CoV and SARS-CoV have been associated with cases of myocarditis. 
The first case of myocarditis in uh, caused by COVID-19 was published in February 2020 from Shenzhen, China. As we can see here also, the diagnosis was primarily based on imaging and cardiac biomarkers and there was no definitive diagnosis based on biopsy or cardiac MRI findings. Subsequently, a multitude of case reports have been published uh, describing uh, COVID-19 related myocarditis uh, from different parts of the world. However, even now, after these reports, it is not possible to identify the exact incidence of uh, myocarditis in this infection because the modalities of diagnosis in all these case reports were very different and biopsy and see, uh, cardiac MRI was used only in a very limited manner, obviously due to non-availability -avail issues and uh, the difficulty with disinfection after use in a COVID-19 patient. The proposed pathophysiologic mechanism is that uh, after uh, entry into the host cell via ACE2 receptors, which is uh, very uh, uh, which is expressed in abundance in myocardium as well, the the virus actually leads to recruitment of CD8 T cells via priming via antigen processing cells as well as via binding to uh, through a growth factor which is secreted by the human heart. These primed CD8 cells are thought to migrate to ca cardiac tissue specifically and then lead to cell mediated injury. This is further exacerbated in patients who have cytokine storm in which these T cells lead to a more CD8 positive T cells. These pathophysiologic mechanisms were further substantiated by MRI studies. This is a large cohort from Germany in which uh, 100 patients who had recovered from COVID-19, most of whom had only mild to moderate infection, underwent MRI with a median time period of about 70 days. Of these, about 60% were found to have evidence of active inflammation in the form of raised uh, myocardial native T2. Uh, However, here also EM biopsy could be done only in three patients with severe findings which revealed lymphocytic inflammation. Now it should be uh, noted that these findings were also present in risk factor matched controls as well. For example, abnormal native T1 which is suggestive of interstitial fibrosis was found in 40% of risk factor matched controls as well. So MRI is a very sensitive modality which tends to pick up a lot of abnormalities. So how far did it really reflect the incidence of myocarditis was not clear. This was further validated by autopsy studies which were done to confirm whether viral RNA is actually present in myocardial cells in uh, confirmed COVID-19 cases and whether inflammatory cells are seen or not. So one of the first autopsy studies was from Germany again which reported uh, cardiac tissue from 39 consecutive autopsy cases. In this study, although in 41% of cases, uh, viral uh, RNA could be demonstrated, it was noted that no inflammatory cells were present in any of these cases. So while, uh, vir while cardiotropism of the virus could be demonstrated in this study, there was no evidence of myocarditis. There was another patho uh, pathologic study in 21 uh, autopsy cases, where macrophage infiltration was noted in 86% cases while only in three cases lymphocytic myocarditis could be demonstrated. So in view of these findings, uh, the concern that was expressed in the initial phase of the pandemic that 20 to 40 percent of individuals have evidence of myocardial injury which was mainly defined by rise in troponin levels uh, could be alleviated. It is to be noted that troponin rise is not unique to COVID-19 infection only. It has been seen previously also in cases of severe community acquired pneumonias, influenza pneumonias. The primary cause here is a type 2 myocardial ischemia due to increased demand secondary to fever or tachycardia and decreased supply which may happen in cases with hypoxemia and hypotension. So this troponin elevation though it signifies myocardial injury is not uh, suggestive of myocarditis as was originally proposed. But it is nevertheless a risk factor as can be seen. Um, so these are the different causes of uh, troponin uh, elevation. 
myocarditis is only an uncommon cause which which we as we have seen is not really seen very commonly in autopsies troponin elevation can be seen due to supply demand mismatch due to stress cardiomyopathy which happens in cases of cytokine storm and un the uncommonly due to myocardial infarctions as well the important point is that troponin elevation though not suggestive of myocarditis always is a poor prognostic marker 46 uh, as we can see that in patients uh, who had troponin elevation 46 percent succumb to the uh, disease while in cases with, without troponin elevation the survival was better Diagnos for diagnosis of myocarditis the clinical features may vary some patients might have a mild disease only in the form of dyspnea and fatigue or on the other spectrum there can be permanent myocarditis with uh, pulmonary edema and cardiogenic shock ecg may show evidence of new onset bundle branch blocks ventricular uh, premature complexes and conduction abnormalities x-ray may show uh, cardiomegaly in severe cases uh, the societies uh, recommend additional imaging modalities for confirmation of diagnosis and in most of the cases echocardiogram is the primary diagnostic modality because it is portable and it is there is ease of disinfection after use. Cardiac MRI has definitive advantages over the other uh, imaging modalities but uh, because of non-availability in off hours and uh, relative difficulty in disinfection it is not very commonly used one good alternative is CT angio in which is uh, already being done in most of the case patients with ARDS in which coronary anatomy and myocardial edema can be demonstrated the management of myocarditis here is mostly supportive and the primary management should be of the infection itself which is leading to this uh, inflammatory disorder the next uh, prime the next uh, point of concern is how to manage acute coronary syndromes in covid-19 first of all whether covid-19 can trigger acs based on observations from other viral infections like influenza or even bacterial pneumonias we know that these infections lead to uh, inflammation and prothrombotic state which can trigger uh, acs in a vulnerable patient Ever since the onset of the pandemic, multiple reports have been, uh, multiple cases have been reported whereby the primary presentation is STEMI and COVID-19 is diagnosed later. So we don't really know whether COVID-19 is one of the triggers of ACS here. And if it is, then it is causing to ACS even in the absence of substantial systemic inflammation. The possible mechanisms include the, uh, plaque rupture, vasospasm, or microthrombi. As we have seen, COVID-19 is associated with infiltration with macrophages. These macrophages release collagenases that can degrade the fibrous caps on atherosclerotic plaques leading to plaque rupture. They also release tissue factor which can act as a potent procoagulant leading to thrombosis over these plaque ruptures. And a direct effect of the virus on endothelial uh, tissue leading to endothelialitis can also increase the risk of thrombic thrombus formation at ACS. But all said and done, in the initial part of the pandemic, it was observed that there was a sharp decrease in the incidence of STEMIs all over the world. Now, this was initially attributed to the uh, decrease in presentation of patients to hospitals because of the fear of contracting infection in a hospital setting. However, it was subsequently realized that even closed communities where the chance of missing cases, like in, the, like in that US uh, North Californian study, the numbers were actually low. So it was proposed that there might be a true decrease in the incidence of STEMIs for, due to unrecognized un factors like decrease in environmental air pollution, decrease in occupational stress during the lockdown period. But this is an area, this is an area that uh, has not been explored fully. Another uh, trend that was noticed was a sharp decline in the number of primary PCIs as well as PCIs for other uh, forms of ACS across the world in the initial part of the pandemic, though it is picking up right now. And even in centers where PCIs are being done, there, there is a delay from uh, uh, the patient presentation to the uh, balloon time. The classical door to balloon time is not being met now. 
the primary delay is from the is the patient related only even now because patients are coming to the hospital late because of fear of uh, uh, coming to the hospital uh, and then there are system related factors also which lead to delay because of uh, waiting for uh, diagnostic results of covid-19 the uh, donning of pp by the cath lab personnel so there is a need for improving the patient and system related delays in um, symptom to door time as well as door to balloon time in patients with STEMI. Concomitant with a decrease in STEMI's uh, presentations all over the world, it was observed that there is an increase in the incidence of out of hospital cardiac arrests uh, since the onset of the pandemic. In a study from Lombardy region in Italy, uh, it was observed that there was a 52% increase in sudden deaths as compared to the same period in 2019. This trend was correlating with the cumulative incidence of COVID-19 cases. Similar reports were then, uh, uh, similar uh, uh, trends were then reported from the US as well as uh, France also. The possible reasons for this sharp increase in sudden deaths uh, after the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic could be due to the increase in the number of hypoxemic respiratory failure with rapid progression of ARDS. Many of these patients may might not be symptomatic in spite of severe hypoxemia and might not reach the hospital before uh, the uh, terminal phase. Another infection related cause could be due to uh, increase in arrhythmic sudden cardiac deaths. It has been proposed that some of the drugs that are being used to treat uh, COVID-19 including azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine can lead to QT prolongation and lead to arrhythmic sudden deaths. The inflammation per se, the cytokines including IL-6 can also lead to QT prolongation. As we have seen, myocardial injury is common in these cases. Another factor that could have led to this increase in sudden deaths is the uh, reluctance of patients to come to hospital in cases of time-dependent cardiovascular diseases like STEMI. So patient might wait till he deteriorates to the point that before he can make an EMS call uh, leading to an increase in sudden deaths. There has been an increase in the incidence of arrhythmias as well. In the initial reports from China, the overall incidence of cardiac arrhythmias was 17% uh, uh, overall and 44% in ICU patients. VTVF was observed in about 7% of cases in hospitalized patients. Subsequently, a last observational study from US involving 700 total patients has demonstrated that there, have, there were ni uh, 9 cardiac arrests, about 25 incident AF, and nine cases of bradyarrhythmias. All of these arrhythmic events were more common in ICU patients than in the ward patients and were correlated with the severity of illness. The possible causes of arrhythmias include hypoxia secondary to the pulmonary disease, myocardial injury due to myocarditis or myocardial strain, myocardial ischemia, and the effects of drugs like azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine. There is an increase in the incidence of venous thromboembolism in these COVID in COVID nineteen cases. The uh, overall twenty the uh, incidence is around twenty five percent in hospitalized patients, in, and these are breakthrough events on good thrombo on standard thromboprophylaxis. The possible mechanisms include direct viral induced endotheliolysis or due to indirect causes leading to stasis and high hypercoagulable stage. The recommendation is to give uh, thromboprophylaxis in moderately ill uh, cases and full therapeutic anticoagulation in high-risk patients. This is the practice that is being followed at our institute also. We give in moderate cases prophylactic uh, uh, anticoagulation while in uh, severe cases admitted in ICU, full therapeutic anticoagulation is being given. There is also a concern about whether patients who have recovered from COVID-19 are at an increased short-term risk for cardiovascular events. This concern comes from earlier studies in influenza and bacterial pneumonias, where it has been demonstrated that following recovery from the infection, there is a two to, two to four-fold increase in the risk of 
acute coronary syndromes and an eightfold uh, increase in risk of heart mm -hmm. failure due to persistent inflammation and a poor thrombotic situation. So what is to be done in this situation, even if there is a susceptibility to heart disease after COVID-19, it becomes imperative that we should follow, reinforce optimal medical therapy to all patients at risk, like patients with hypertension, diabetes or established cardiovascular diseases. So to summarize, myocardial injury is reported in 20 to 40 percent of cases, but myocarditis as such is uncommon. The focus should be on the treatment of the underlying infection with supportive management for myocardial injury. The, uh, uh, the, uh, incident, the detection of myocardial injury is, however, a negative prognostic factor. Secondly, the community should be educated on warning signs of a heart attack and timely medical intervention. Social distancing is recommended. However, patients should not deter, be deterred from seeking prompt medical care for cardiac emergencies. In, there is an importance of therapeutic thromboprophylaxis in critically ill COVID-19 patients and awareness about a possible heightened short-term risk of CV events, though no, not demonstrated yet in a vulnerable patient after recovery from COVID-19 infection should be there and we should emphasize on continued uh, optimal medical therapy. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Deepthi, for uh, an excellent presentation and covering most aspects of uh, COVID and uh, cardiology in terms of both acute uh, presentation due to COVID and also things which could be triggered because of COVID may not be primarily because of COVID. And the third aspect of post-COVID where you should not lower a guard because they can, yes, it's, especially if it's a risk, a high risk patient are susceptible to uh, cardiac events. So before we uh, go on to the panel discussion, we'll have a second presentation uh, by Professor Padma, the Chief of the Neuroscience Center. Um, may I request you now to make the presentation? Can we have the slides? Thank you, Ambuj. And thank you, Deepti, for that really great presentation. Now, uh, we all know that, you know, the close encounters with this bug is a nightmare and we continue to pass through it. This one thing which probably we have learned is that, you know, every single day seems to be a, a learning curve and this bug is actually teaching us new things uh, every single day. So directly going now to the, uh, the neurological manifestations and looking beyond the fever cough and the, you know, look at specifically the aspects. So when did we actually know that uh, the organ beyond lungs that can be involved, in fact, it was the first thing that could be involved was a nervous system. And this literature actually came out of China and this was way back in April and what emerged there was that it was a severely affected patients which are more likely to develop neurological symptoms than those COVID-19 patients who had mild and moderate disease and now, now you know that's not true. So the infection to the brain and how does it happen? There were a lot of hypotheses and picturesquely to put it you do have the entry, what is called as through the peripheral nervous system and through the nose, through the cribriform plate and the olfactory system into the brain. And as well as hematogenous spread once the lungs are involved and you have the multi organ. But what was more important here was that was this severity of a respiratory infection also because of the drive from the nervous system infection? So could actually brain be involved in making the lung, lung infection more severe. So that was one thing which started emerging. And the possible mechanisms of neurological involvement, we'll come back to it a little more, you know, closer as we go. But I'm going to start off with the clinical evidence that had emerged over the last nine months. So the first thing was the recognition that there were these mild features like loss of smell and loss of taste as uh, Professor Guleria had alluded to which quickly added on to the flu list if you all remember we had a checklist we had a flu screen 
wherein originally it was always fever, cough, dyspnea, myalgia, chills, what have you. So anosmia and agusia went into the flu screen and got imbibed into the, you know, how to actually identify either the patients or the contacts besides a checklist of coming from red zones, containment zones, and originally it was travel history. Now, of course, that no longer exists. The original observational case series, which was published in Chama Neurology, April 2020, was again in a group of patients who got admitted with severe COVID. They were in the ICU. And in them, about nearly 40% had neurological manifestations, predominantly central nervous system, which could be a varied spectrum in terms of dizziness headache and encephalopathy was all encompassing obviously had a multitude of reasons why a person could be in encephalopathic state and then of course there were these in your face strokes ataxia and seizures the peripheral nervous system manifestations were far more lesser and were more of post-covid autoimmune phenomena which we will talk about a little later and then because of this almost universal presence of ACE2 receptors, not just in respiratory system, now we know in the brain, in the peripheral nerve system, in the muscles, in GI, in, in kidneys, and of course in the cardiac and what have you. So you also had the smilegias and also documented to have a high CPK values. Now this is a representative slide again from Wuhan, who described actually a patient who came in with stroke, didn't really come up with any of those flu screen, flu screen being positive, turned out to have an ischemic pathology on the CT scan and also turned out to have what is called as one of those typical pathognomonic COVID lung on the CT chest showing peripheral the ground glass appearance. So these kind of things started coming up, which meant that either because of the pandemic, the COVID was coming incidentally positive or COVID was doing something to them producing strokes. And then a bunch of biomarkers also started coming out, which sort of typified those individuals who may develop this neurological features, which included a ratio where there was a lower lymphocytes as compared to TLC and an increased blood urea nitrogen. And now we know that even in a kidney injury, the same bunch of biomarkers have come out. So that there was nothing really sine qua non but it did, did mean that things were going beyond the respiratory system involvement. Similar reports also were published in The Lancet. Again, in the admitted patients of 221, wherein nearly 6% had developed strokes during admission. In another report also came in, wherein the 57 critically ill patients, in them as well, there was a group who developed strokes and went on to ICU. Now, what actually came out of all this was that those people who developed the cerebrovascular system pathologies were the ones who went on to have required prolonged ICU care, which is again a no-brainer, it's no rocket science, to know that they would obviously need an ICU care and they didn't do well. The outcomes of those strokes were not very good. And certain things emerged in this cohort of patients who had neurological manifestations that they were generally older, generally had comorbid situations of hypertension, diabetes, underlying cardiac, cardiovascular diseases or malignancy. And once again, the predominant complaint was an encephalopathy. Please remember that encephalopathy is not a sine qua non to a brain being directly involved. Could be due to multitude of other issues as well. So these issues were described time and again Several reports came in March, April, May, and then these things started emerging in the sense it was no longer those patients who were admitted into the ICU with the typical COVID syndrome and then went on to develop neurological manifestations. And now you had patients coming in with directly as common garden variety of just strokes. So they had nothing to suggest that they had anything like a flu, no fever, no cough, no dyspnea, no chills, nothing. No coming from containment zones, no contact, no travel history. They would just come as strokes. And then these patients versus those patients who developed stroke and encephalopathies, there was a, some sort of a similarity that 
the median time of these the occurrence of neurological emergency seem to be much closer to the time of onset of infection so either they came in with strokes and then went on to develop the typical flu like symptoms or got picked up because the chest x-ray had shown typical lung lesions or a ct chest had shown typical lung lesions or once they were admitted with the flu in a medium type of one or two days they went on to develop stroke so whatever was developing means it was not an encephalopathy it was more like a stroke which developed early into the onset of a serious covid infection the more importantly what had happened was that the because they did not have a typical covid like features when they first came in a lot of them had sort of we see through the system of trying to identify these patients so they went on to areas which was non covid and that became a problem and then we had quickly learned from that experience as well and i'll come to that so in the lab findings besides the original bunch of biomarkers which were in terms of a ratio of lymphocyte to total count the other markers came in in terms of ray crp d dimer ferritin without without ldh and we also added on il6 now besides il6 the d dimer ferritin and crp meant that they were going into some kind of a phenomena suggestive of a congenital coagulopathy and also suggestive of development of a thromboembolic phenomena involving both cardiovascular as well as cerebrovascular system so are there any specific lab features then these were the features besides a ratio of total count to the lymphocytes low platelets high urea and an elevated cpk the crp d dimer and ferritin which emerged as markers and now there's a lot of research a lot of centers who are actually looking into serial such biomarkers and the development of these manifestations so this is a beautiful paper which sort of summarized the neurological manifestations and said that the spectrum could involve something very mild like just a headache malaise fatigue imbalance with and without the conventional features of flu anosmia acuta strokes both hemorrhage and infarction neuropathies adm and gbs more of the autoimmune phenomena post or after covid encephalopathy during admission could be encephalitis seizures and other autoimmune phenomena so the hypothesized reasons as deepthi has said one was a presence of ace2 receptors which seem to be there in a lot of areas in the system so all the organs where they are spotted probably were getting involved and the definitive way to say that yes it is neurotropism this bug has gone into the brain will only be there if you actually find those signatures and that now has been available with limited autopsy studies as well as this, the csf markers have now been available so the originally it was just seen to be a brain tissue which was hyperemic or 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 edematous but now we know that there are definitive signatures available and of course now we know that it could be a retrograde neuronal root peripheral nervous system that is through the cribriform plate or the hematogenous the low lymphocyte counts indicative of immunosuppression in such patients especially in the severe subgroup may be one reason and we already talked about the congenital coagulopathy problem we also talked about the skeletal muscle injury because of the presence of ace2 receptors and then we have the infection mediated harmful immune response and the cytokine storm you've heard about it but the encephalopathy could also be because of all pervading hypoxia acidosis multi organ dysfunction sepsis and even certain medications that these people are given sometimes when they are prone then they need to be sedated so encephalopathy could be multifactorial and not necessarily always sine qua non to the because the bugs have gone there specifically for covid-19 and stroke there was one report which analyzed it the original report said that they were largely older patients except one wherein there was a cvst or this cerebral venous sinus thrombosis and according to tos classification there was no specific subtype which emerged as a you know the variety but then later we've got several reports of classically young people who really didn't have conventional risk factors and they were all large artery thrombosis 
and we had our own publications this we published in may where the initial two strokes which came into our er as just a stroke with nothing to suggest covid were intracerebral bleeds and this we had published in the annals of indian academy the age and comorbidities because a large number of people who do badly with covid-19 are also the elderly with other you know comorbidities and this again is a common uh, you know knowledge right now so that could also be leading to strokes and the covid and cardiovascular heart and brain have such an intricate and close relationship the heart gets involved brain does get involved ways more than one and the inflammatory response and the risk of stroke is again well established atherosclerosis itself is an inflammatory process so this could be a trigger and destabilizing a plaque and the rupture and the cytokine storm are you well aware of this upsurge of il6 and various ways to combat it and the prothrombotic prothrombotic state as we said before and this had a little implication as well in terms of managing these patients whether they need to continue on antiplatelets and double antiplatelets and whether we can thrombolize but there are now guidelines which have emerged there are consensus statements which have emerged we have in fact our own consensus statement from for india which we published so and the infections you know that a large number of viruses can actually directly cause arthritis and arteriopathy classically you have varicella involving the arteries and you have the childhood arteriopathy because of that now that could be one of the reasons we don't know maybe this corona bug behaves differently from other corona viruses now i'm sorry about this busy slide but this actually summarizes the entire list the gamma of neurological manifestations with covid which if if uh, you know it actually describes the variety how they present the diagnostic modalities that can be employed to establish so this is what i had summarized earlier as well but this is a picture this is another you know cartoon which tells you that the neurological manifestations could be because of a systemic pathology because of sepsis and this could be one of the reasons why there would be encephalopathy that also could cause strokes the direct nerve being the 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 bug getting in you know invasion into the central nervous system and that can cause typically the encephalitis it could be peripheral nervous system classically you've seen this this one thing very interesting here that generally we've seen that anosmia glutea are the features which are seen in milder complaints and they generally do well and most important ladies and gentlemen is a post infectious which could be immune related gbs and a variety of neuropathies but the one big thing that i put below as a degenerative diseases this is where in fact there is a there is a universal there is a big initiator multi country initiative which is looking into it the development of neurocognitive and neurodegenerative processes that may be happening and we know that mental health for reasons more than one and there are a lot of issues which are seen in these individuals so since the olfactory system is getting involved and that is a common entry point for the development of neurodegenerations classically like parkinsons and alzheimers there is this global initiative which has been launched institute is also one in that to look into what's going to happen to this post covid the survivors now we have a covid tail now this is a new terminology which has been coined looking into the post covid syndromes you know they have lung problems you know they have this myalgia fatigue you know have this mental health issues we are also looking into the presence of the neurodegenerations and cognitive and other issues so the covid tail is another one which probably will be important the last part of my talk is managing a non covid emergency in a covid pandemic and classically it is strokes you know it rains strokes every day even now we have four to five strokes coming into our er so in that uh, artery which is blocked is blocked covid or non covid it needs to be unblocked just like an mi just like you have an acute coronary syndrome so there's been a protected gout stroke which has been established it has been published it could be region specific algorithm centelli stroke which we have also developed so in this classically the two things time is brain so an artery is blocked you need to unblock it so what do you do you need to take care of yourself the healthcare personnel take care of the patient take care of the system so you're not contaminating 
you know, don't end up fumigating and, you know, sanitizing your corridors, your lifts, your CTs and MRs. So the guidelines have come in place, essentially have measures wherein you stay protected. You have certain measures wherein you screen out as much as possible. Sometimes it isn't. All the aerosol generating procedures are curtailed. You have a high, you know, rather I should say a lower threshold to intubate and a higher threshold to extubate such individuals and the CT remains are workhorse. We have a high threshold to get an MRI for our uh, you know, management of stroke patients and the COVID positive are shifted quickly to designated COVID area, suspect or holding area and we have holding areas defined in most of our super specialities including neurology and cardiology and we have the corridors which have been designated as green corridors for the COVID suspect and the COVID non-suspect. And this has been actually published recently by Adnan Khurishi group, wherein whatever way the patient, a stroke who's COVID positive, suspect, or, uh, you know, who is likely to be a suspect, all of them have the, the plain CT scan remains the workhorse. Along with CT, we also do a CT chest, which sometimes does pick up a COVID lung features. And we have a CT angiography. Now for an IV thrombolysis, we do nothing more. For a, an interventional program, we do get a CBNAT and TrueNAT. We get the report within a couple of hours and then they go in for EVT. It is true, just like DT said, the initial stroke figures drop, but now they have picked up tremendously, I must say. The IVT is going on, but the mechanical thrombectomy for reasons more than one are definitely limited. Again, because of several limitations across the pathways which still probably need to be streamlined. So um, I think uh, I have gone backwards. All right. So these are the consensus statements we've got out also for autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis. You can actually access these publications. I'll just put them up. This is the stroke management consensus statement. Uh, AIMS along with Indian Stroke of Association, we've published this. We've also published the guidelines for multiple sclerosis and other demyelinating diseases in May 2020. And we've also published our experience of the stroke and COVID per se, both hemorrhages and stroke, and also the mechanisms, whether they're incidental, because it's a pandemic, they triggered or directly cause a death. So we have recently had an, a publication on a systematic review of what all is known about stroke and coronavirus disease. But the implication, as has also been said before, is most important is that we need to have these red flags up, antenna really there, to be able to identify these individuals who present with absence of classical conventional flus like symptoms. Because you miss them, then they become super spreaders across the healthcare systems. And more importantly, if you delay a managing a stroke patient just because it's COVID suspect or COVID or you don't know about it, then you're losing out on crucial management and there'd be disastrous results every way for the patient, for the healthcare workers and the health system. So never ever give up on your patient, COVID or non-COVID. Know your signs and act accordingly. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for a very comprehensive uh, coverage of the all aspects of neurology and COVID, uh, including obviously uh, non-COVID cases which have to be managed very uh, optimally in this uh, era of the pandemic. And then uh, we also have on the panel uh, Dr. Neeraj Mishal, who is a very familiar face for to all of us. And for, for this, this program right through. May I uh, ask Neeraj to conduct the panel discussion with you? Thank you, sir. Uh, so, after two enriching uh, lectures, uh, we would like to uh, share the experience and the questions which has been uh, sent to us uh, from various centers of excellences. Uh, we will take them one by one. So, uh, I will start with the first question, uh, Dr. Deepthi and Dr. Amuj, uh, they have to respond to this question. Uh, this question is from Jharkhand. Uh, uh, this is regarding uh, any precipitating factors which contribute to viral myocarditis in COVID. 
and how to manage acute myocardial infarction. So we have covered it, but uh, just to briefly summarize what should be done in such patients, I will request Dr. Deepi and follow up. Thank you, sir. Um, the number of, though various case reports have been published about viral myocarditis in COVID, but most of these reports did not have a definitive diagnostic modality like histopathological evaluation or cardiac MRI. So the actual precipitating factors in these cases is not clear and have not been evaluated yet. If we extrapolate the results from reports of viral myocarditis due to other viruses, uh, there are um, uh, host genetic factors involved as well as acquired factors which predispose to uh, myocardial inflammation in certain individuals while in similar individuals who are living in a similar environment do not have any cardiac involvement at all. So it has been observed in animal models that there can be differences in host genetic factors like major histocompatibility complexes and HLA antigens which can predispose some individual to development of myocarditis. Similarly, acquired factors like selenium deficiency seen in, uh, can lead to myocarditis uh, as has been seen in some Chinese provinces. In the pathophysiology of COVID-19 myocarditis also, we saw that there are certain growth factors and antigen presenting cells which were involved in priming of the CD8 positive T cell lymphocytes which ultimately lead to cell mediated cytotoxicity. So what factors exactly lead to to development of myocarditis is not clear so far. The second question regarding management of acute myocardial infarction in the ideal setting for a case of STEMI, primary PCI will remain the uh, pr primary management strategy. However, in resource limited settings where we expect that there will be a door to uh, needle time, a door to balloon time of more than uh, two hours because of COVID related delays. A pragmatic approach will be to go for thrombolysis first, uh, especially in low risk cases. And then if it is unsuccessful to perform a rescue PCI later once the screening comes positive. In cases of high risk cases, like even in high risk NSTACS, uh, we need to streamline our health uh, resources so that a PCI can be performed in a timely manner. I'll request Dr. Mm -hmm. Amgush to... Well, I think, uh... We have covered most of the aspects, but it remains uh, that the myocarditis, the first part, is relatively low from our experience. Now uh, we've seen uh, hundreds of patients in our COVID center, and uh, myocarditis uh, remains low, and is probably the few who develop are only those who have severe systemic disease. So just part of the systemic disease, you can develop myocarditis. Uh, and of course, once you develop that, the uh, so that is one aspect, so, and, and very importantly, not all rise in troponin is myocarditis. It's important to realize that because now troponin is very widely available, and uh, once you see a high troponin, there's a lot of panic that there is myocarditis. That may not be true. A lot of patients in our uh, relatively step-down uh, facility of uh, the IC Jaja, we are we are more moderate uh, sick patients. Even in them, we've seen that troponin was high in eight to ten percent. And they had a fairly uh, good outcomes uh, with very low uh, mortality uh, or you know, very low need for death care. So even there, token was right. I so there could be several reasons, so we should not panic on seeing a high token. Uh, it's the whole clinical picture of cardiac mortality uh, uh, should be uh, considered. And as for future uh, management, again, as we mentioned. But uh, we are following, uh, because you know, it's really a system <laughs> for a primary PCI uh, facility is there or not. Uh, possible requires a lot of PP and a lot of preparedness. Uh, so it may be pragmatic to use mobilizers and then probably go for more invasive procedures. Yeah, thank you. So I'll just add to that question. Uh, this question is again from Jhakan. Like we are sitting uh, in a relatively better equipped uh, center aims. What if such case comes in a primary care settings at community centers and primary health centers? Then what should be the ideal approach for managing a patient of cases? So so it's a very patient. relevant uh, question. Uh, for any any time, and with pandemic, without pandemic, uh, as ma'am have mentioned, you know, whenever artery is blocked, whether it be from the brain or the heart, 
uh, time is essence, uh, the time is muscle, or time is brain, really quickly restore blood flow. Uh, because if you see of all management, what works best is timely management. The, the more you hours you lose, uh, the mortality starts creeping up. So we need to treat early and uh, wherever the first aid, so to say, in acute coronary syndrome is giving, loading the patient with aspirin, 350 milligrams, giving a loading dose of clopidogrel, 300 mg, and giving 80 mg of uh, torvastatin. And that can be done at any city. And, and you will be surprised to know this, the cumulative benefit of this is almost equal to that of uh, primary PCI. So it's not that the high-end procedures only save lives. It's, it's very basic management is very important. So in primary care settings, you must do these three things. Wherever it is feasible to have a minimal monitoring, a thrombolytic therapy can be given. Uh, if you have a small CCU or just a defibrillator and a monitor. That can be done. Otherwise, give these three drugs and refer him to the higher center. Uh, and, and, and it's imperative to do that in all health care settings. Yeah, thank you, sir. So basic management will remain the same with or without COVID. So that has to be followed. Uh, this question is for Professor Padma. Uh, though we have explained uh, very recently how uh, do we manage a patient's stroke uh, with COVID. Just for the benefit of this question has been asked uh, by one of CDP, how to manage a patient with COVID-19 stroke, whether it's hemorrhagic or uh, ischemic, depending on the situation and resource limited setting. What should be done? Right. So we we now talking about COVID positive patient. Yeah. So in that situation, it's a hemorrhage. Then whether it's COVID positive or they're COVID negative, the conservative management will come in first, of course. And the most important would be the blood pressure management and the measurement and, and the raised ICT. So it's the same thing that you are in a COVID designate, wearing a PPE, and you're managing the blood pressure that the ideal blood pressure to maintain in that situation is essentially 140 by 90 because in a bleed you're trying to maintain it a much lower level as compared to an acute ischemic stroke take care of the raised ICT trouble happens when there is a surgery required in that situation you will have to get the surgeons involved and that is in a tertiary setting in a limited care setting you definitely need monitoring you need to take care of BP raised ICT and general nursing that's for bleed per se. The second is the acute ischemic stroke, which is again time sensitive in that if you have a plain CT scan available, I don't even need a high end CT scan with an angiography. If you have, you can get a plain CT available. Your blood pressure is less than 180 by 110. Your glucose is okay. And the plain CT doesn't show a bleed. And you have a thrombolytic drug, which is either alteplase or tenectic place available with you, go ahead and thrombolize. You can do that at a district level with a checklist. So that is feasible and that is being done. You can have a tele kind of a consult even with a hub or to any person that you have a contact with, but that you should be able to do it. Now, in even a center which doesn't even have a plain CT scan, and you are a COVID designate and you need to just take into a COVID facility, then you go ahead, give them aspirin and clopidogrel and a high dose statin and manage as any other acute medical emergency. That again, you will be able to do. So in such situations where a CT scan per se is not available, you suspect that there is an acute stroke. You don't know whether it is an infarct or bleed. In such a situation, it is definitely advisable to contact a place where there is a CT and you need to get because there is no way clinically you can identify between an infarct and a bleed. So you won't be able to give an antiplatelet, your blood thinners without a CT scan. That's the big difference between probably the heart and the brain. But in a limited resource settings, these things are possible when it is a COVID positive patient who's developed a stroke or who's camera stroke and who you have diagnosed him also to be COVID positive. Would that answer, yeah. Neeraj? Yes, yeah. and thank you. I think that must have answered me what it helps uh, this 
So, and a good question, uh, just, uh, just a follow up with, uh, with uh, both uh, Professor Roy and uh, Professor uh, So, this is regarding uh, the role of homolysis and uh, duration. These two questions always uh, remain. So, I will ask Professor Ramu's first follow up question. So, if a patient with DVT, say example, if a patient with DVT and COVID had come, so what should be the strategy for any Change uh, the duration or uh, type of anticoagulation. So there are two things. Uh, if there is a diagnosed uh, anticoagulation uh, and diagnosed uh, you know thromboembolism, uh, then the protocols will be kind of similar to you would treat any VT uh, in any setting, whether it be and depending on whether it's a proximal DVT or it's a thromboembolism. So. Again, the, the management and duration will be similar. Uh, having said that, the, uh, I think the essential question is what are the anticoagulation uh, measures that is needed in uh, COVID patients as such who do not have diagnosed DVT? I think that is the more important question. And uh, we've learned in this uh, during the last six months of this disease, uh, although there is not very definite. Uh, scientific data on it, but now there is large consensus that COVID make, is a pro-coagulant state. And across the board, across all guidelines, national, international, if you see, everybody recommends anticoagulation. So even in moderate cases, we start with anticoagulation, as uh, Dr. Mithi had mentioned, 40 mg only. And once you develop severe, you go to 40 mg PD of enoxaparin or equivalent dosage of other anticoagulants that you may use. Uh, you may even use heparin, especially in patients who have uh, CKD, where it cannot be used. Uh, and in patients who have even, are even sicker and have high D dimer levels, I would say in them we should go up to the full anticoagulation, which is one MP per kg uh, twice a day. So, anticoagulation is a very important part of COVID management, even in the absence of diagnosis. Like that. Uh, regarding one of the cortical event thrombosis patients, which we are getting. So, what should be our uh, strategy for so CVST, yes, and uh, that's been also recognized in COVID positive patients. And as Dr. Ambud said, we go ahead with anticoagulation. The thing is, the maintenance and the duration of anticoagulation here. We have now have literature also coming from south of India, and also we've also seen that we're shifting to the newer anticoagulants. So you give them the, the injectable, and then when you need to, you know, then they're well enough, they turn negative, but the CVST needs to be monitored and followed up for definitely over a period of few weeks to probably at least three months. In such a situation, you do shift over to either VKA or a NOAC, and these days we are preferring NOAC for, for reasons more than one because they've become more affordable as well. And it is far more, it is much less a tight rope walk with a newer anticoagulant as compared to VKA. So what's the duration we're following? Three months. And during this process, we look for the other, you know, the, the, the APLAS and the vasculitis and all the others. But the procoagulant workup cannot be done while on anticoagulation, then we withdraw. We see, and then if there's an underlying situation, then we continue. But largely, post COVID, we're giving for three months for CBST. Thank you, ma'am. That's very clear and all. So, this question, Dr. Deepi, uh, there is uh, a lot of debate about role of antiplatelets, routine use of antiplatelets in suspicion. So, uh, what do you think should be the role of antiplatelets? Should it be given at the time of discharge or the course of treatment? That's a role. Um, aspirin has not been evaluated formally in patients where without comorbidities. There is a small case control study, a proof of concept study, which has demonstrated that administration of aspirin in severely ill hospitalized patients has led to better outcomes. The probable mechanism apart from the antiplatelet effect is that aspirin also has some anti-inflammatory and antiviral effects uh, due to its interference with uh, nitric oxide pathways. Currently, a lot of studies are underway, including one at our center, and hopefully we will have an answer in a couple of months. But so far, routine use of aspirin at a discharge in a patient without comorbidities is not recommended. Thank you, 
I think so. I mean, uh, I can just add. So, aspirin use uh, should be based on your cardiovascular risk, which you would do in any patient anyway. So, like if he has established cardiovascular disease, or if you have multiple risk factors for cardiovascular disease, like diabetic and hypertensive, and uh, risk for cardiovascular disease is high, in those cases, aspirin uh, should be given and must be given uh, uh, on discharge also. But for routine use, as she said, uh, there are ongoing trials. And, uh, we don't think as of now. This is also important because in many patients we see thrombocytopenia. So if not indicated, then this may actually harm the patient. So we have to be very rational by using the And uh, this again, an important question: role of steroid in myocardial. Uh, traditionally, uh, the American Heart Health Society does not recommend steroids, routine use of steroids in cases of viral myocarditis. However, in case reports of COVID-19 myocarditis, glucocorticoids have been used. Uh, the exact uh, role is not clear for viral myocarditis here. It can be given for the underlying infection itself, but how it will help in changing the course of myocarditis is not clear. Uh, I think uh, so. so uh, as of today, uh, we have to uh, follow giving steroids as per uh, the disease COVID uh, severity. So, if uh, anyway, in order to severe uh, COVID condition, we, we initiate uh, steroids, and which is one of the only few drugs which have been shown to be beneficial. So, it, the, the the administration of steroids should be determined by the uh, state of the COVID severity rather than by myocarditis. And also, as I said, myocarditis has been seen in more severe cases, so you would anyway be prescribed. So basically, if it is during the cytokine storm or the later part of the day, in those situations when the inflammation is thought to be the major uh, problematic area, in those cases, steroid may have a role, but the uh, initial part of the day, definitely steroid should uh, and uh, one important again, this post uh, COVID 19 syndrome which we are talking about. So, uh, is there any increased chance of any cardiac uh, morbidity, mortality after uh, routine discharge of patients? Do they monitor themselves for some problems or anticipate such problems, or is there any way of preventing such complications? How true is that? It, uh... There is no direct evidence available from the current pandemic, but we have extrapolate. We can extrapolate from reports from influenza and bacterial pneumonias in the past. These diseases are associated with an increased demand uh, in the form of inflammation and prothrombotic state. So, in a patient, in a vulnerable patient who has pre-existing cardiovascular illness, there is a possibility that these there is a short-term risk of heightened cardiovascular risk at least for the next 30 days or 60 days after the resolution of the infection. So the same thing might apply to COVID-19, though it remains to be investigated. So till it becomes clear, what we can do is that we can opti optimize the medical therapy for these patients, including treatment of risk factors like hypertension and diabetes mellitus. And in patients with established cardiovascular diseases, optimized use of antiplatelets and statins. Till it becomes clear whether there actually any heightened risk uh, remains or not. So just an extension of that question. Uh, we have heard a lot of cases that a patient who has recovered but suddenly dies instantly. Uh, so has had such problem. So how uh, how can we prevent this? How real is this problem? So I mean, uh, this is something uh, which uh, again, like uh, COVID has taught us so many things. This is something which is coming up. And again, we, as we presented that slide, a very nice summary. Uh, so, you know, these conditions are inflammatory conditions. And we know inflammation is one of the major triggers for any acute cardiac syndrome or even for stroke. Although atherosclerotic is in, atherosclerosis now, you know, it's essentially a form of inflammation also. So, this uh, we should not. The therapies should not end with discharge from COVID uh, facility. We have to keep in mind that uh, you there is a heightened risk of a cardiovascular, to cardiovascular event 
post covid and therefore as we said we must maximize cardio protective cardiovascular protective uh, therapies in these patients so if there are patients who have cardiovascular disease all measures uh, of cardiovascular protection whether it be in form aspirin statin ras inhibitors like this because we are these as indicated must be given good control of diabetes good control of hypertension and uh, i'm sure these three four measures when taken in a patient given by merit of the risk of the patient will substantially reduce the uh, risk for uh, related complications like certain death or uh, cardiac symptoms so that is you know we should not be complacent that uh, covid is gone now we have to look at the patient uh, in, in, in that uh, chronic care uh, has to be treated primarily that's very important. So identifying at risk patients and then taking assessment step is essential for managing this long-term complication of COVID. Uh, uh, Professor Padma, uh, I just request you a question, which this is very common that a patient develops anosmia, loss of taste. So is it is it a good marker or bad marker? Any prognostic significance we can attach to this? Uh, as said, because some people feel that just taking Parkinson's disease, it may actually portend a bad prognosis. Some say, okay, no, the patients developing these symptoms recover without any complications. So, what is your take on that? So far, it's uh, emerged that the uh, anosmia and agusia are seen in milder disease, and uh, they also recover. And the median time of recovery could be something like two to six weeks. There have been like, some uh, studies which used a short course of steroids. Some didn't. They just they retrain the smell. Uh, you know, some kind of measures. So in general, it's been associated with a milder disease and a good recovery. They do well. What we don't know, though, because of the hypothesized mechanism that loss of smell has also been a sort of a harbinger for the development of degenerative diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. There is a consortium looking into whether these COVID survivors develop that. in course of time we do not know right now we know that they do well associated with a milder disease but we also know that the covid survivors do exhibit certain mental health issues and certain other issues but nobody's really followed them up for a period of 6 months 1 year 2 years and as we said in the beginning we still on a learning curve in spite of being on this thing for the last 10 months 9 months 10 months whatever so we don't know neeraj but it is there there's a serious concern and people are looking into it what's the evidence we have it's a mild disease so relax thank you mehbub that will see from those and we will definitely <laughs> learn about this uh, the outcome of all these complications in long term uh one important question uh, regarding the uh, lab values we sometimes get patients who have b diver values which are out of place out of uh, it's very complicated to interpret what how much importance should we give to those values say the high read and the value for patient is doing fine maybe at the time of discharge or at time of presentation or those who are in home world how should we approach such patients in hospitalized patients there are now recommendations that d dimer values above 30 should receive therapeutic anticoagulation for patients at home quarantine uh, So I'm. Do you want to? I mean, uh, we have to know the D dimer is a more specific marker also, and uh, can uh, acute phase reactant kind of thing can go high in several conditions. So we have to look at other factors together and not go by D dimer only. Uh, and so, for example, we there is a improved score that is normally used for VT risk stratification. And as this is one question about NOAC use at discharge with the dimer is high, so what we have been definitely doing is we have used this uh, uh, score for the improved, which has the dimer also as part of it. And uh, if the score is high, then there is a recommendation to use anticoagulation. It could be any one of those drugs. Uh, it could be atrazine, rivaroxaban, or even dabigatran can be used, uh, which is a relatively cheaper drug. So I uh, I think uh, it should be based on the risk of the patient, and the score basically goes by 
immobility, so if the patient is going to be immobile or if he has heart failure or if he has concomitant cancer, uh, has evidence of VT. So the more these things are there, there is uh, greater merit in giving a prolonged uh, anticoagulation post discharge. And as Ma'am said, given the scenario of difficulty of monitoring VTAs, uh, probably a direct uh, or an anticoagulation. The newer ones will be. You might like to add a little bit. So, take take home messages do not just rely on lab values. We have to evaluate the patient in, as a complete package, not just the just one lab value is out of frame, so you start taking that. So, that may actually cause more harm. So, you have to evaluate it totality. That should be the take home message. And one important question, sir, regarding the uh, rhythm disorders which we observe in such patients. Many patients develop sin sinus bradycardia, which may or may not be symptomatic. Some may have other sort of rhythm disorders. So, how should we approach uh, such patients? Again, that is something which has been seen with COVID that uh, rhythm disorders are quite common. In fact, the uh, national grand round we did, we presented the case of patient who presented with a severe sinus bradycardia and they required uh, uh, support with uh, dopamine for improving the chromatomy chronotropy uh, during the initial 24 to 48 hours, uh, but it was reversible and such case reports are there in the literature where uh, the induction system involvement has been uh, uh, shown uh, due to COVID and uh, because as, as discussed, uh, the ACE2 uh, receptors are as much present here as in part of the body. So, uh, rhythm disorders have been described. Uh, uh, again, atrial fibrillation is also been described, but atrial fibrillation again is common in ICU settings where you have pulmonary disease, uh, where you have elderly population. So again, these patients uh, can have atrial fibrillation too. And uh, also ventricular ectopics and ventricular tachycardia has been described. But again, it, it is part of the systemic disease where you have multiple uh, risk factors. Uh, you know, you have cytokine storm is there, you may have this electrolytemia. So there are several things which are going on. You may be on drugs which prolong the long QT. So, whether it's primarily due to COVID or primarily because of the fact that the patient is sick is difficult to tease uh, uh, out, but it is important that you should have keep these things in mind. These formalities can happen and they should be managed uh, uh, as per protocol. Basically, we have to observe and as situation uh, because we see a lot of time that patient has. Uh, sinus bradycardia, but they are asymptomatic. So, all we need is to watch uh, very closely and uh, let uh, the body take uh, care of that part. But of course, if patient is symptomatic, then that has to be managed as per the protocol. And uh, this question uh, how to manage heart disease complicating pregnancy and cytokine storm? So, <laughs> I <laughs> don't like a, a viva, <laughs> of course. Uh, <laughs> Hypothetical question, luckily we have not received any pregnant patient who have this sort of uh, complicated uh, course. But again, this is a matter uh, which, which actually we should be discussing and how to go on. I received this set of questions from Hardik. I thought you would take this question. So, anyway, <laughs> so as you said, we do not have an experience of a cytokine storm in a pregnant patient. And probably because uh, it happens more in elderly patients. Not get so much into it, uh, but I would say uh, heart disease management would not be any different from any routine pregnancy. All the measures that you would take uh, otherwise uh, should be done. Uh, you know, uh, these patients generally we advise them, uh, uh, advise them to be in relatively uh, relative rest during the second trimester. Fluid uh, management has to be uh, done. Uh, uh, very carefully, uh, fluid overloads should be avoided, uh, and depending on the cardiac uh, region in the mother, uh, accordingly the labor has to be managed. Uh, so uh, it's not any different from a non-COVID patient. I would say it's kind of similar. But you need to have a team working together uh, of a cardiologist, of an obstetrician, and somebody from infectious disease or and from anesthesia, so that the uh, labor and the very labor can be managed properly. So, maybe you would like that. So, yes, again, uh, uh, the uh, important part with, with uh, theoretically, 
because we have not seen any complicated pregnancy patients so far. But the life of mother should get precedence over the fetus uh, uh, life because we have to use certain medication which may have religious effect on the fetus, which we are not sure. If the patient is in cytokine storm, we may use, we, have, we may have to use high doses of steroid, especially in first trimester, we know all these steroids can cause uh, uh, congenital effects like. Uh, left palate and other or you know uh, IUGR and other things. So we have to actually risk uh, weigh the risk and benefit and if the problem if we have to save a life then of course mother cycle is going to be present. And we have to in, have to take informed consent for every procedure which we do. If we are uh, giving any experimental therapy, even if it's a plasma therapy, if you are uh, giving remdesivir or steroid, we have to explain everything to the uh, patient and the relatives so that any medical legal complications will not arise uh, in future regarding this. But again, uh, the management has to be as per the situation. Uh, there cannot be a, uh, a fit all uh, shoe type of things where one protocol can be applicable to everyone. It has to be managed based to this uh, We have covered almost all cases, so just uh, as a concluding remark, I will just request Dr. Dick if you want to say. Comments. I'll again reiterate that myocardial injury which has been described to so commonly in COVID is basically because of the infection itself and not uh, primary myocarditis is not very common in these patients. Secondly, we need to create awareness in the community to come to the hospital early in cases of uh, cardio cardiac emergencies like ST elevation MI so that treatment is not delayed. For venous thromboembolism, almost one-fourth of the patients experience breakthrough episodes even on prophylactic anticoagulation. So in severe cases, as is the institutional protocol, therapeutic anticoagulation should be given. And uh, lastly, we should uh, uh, look into the post-COVID care. Uh, we should optimize medical therapy in all these patients, especially in the uh, at-risk patients so that post-COVID inflammatory uh, increase in risk doesn't happen for these patients. So a lot of it has actually been well summarized by Deepti. I would reiterate the same, that please don't ignore the acute emergencies, especially strokes, they're time sensitive, come to the hospital and also the hospital should be geared up to treat these emergencies according to the established protocols, COVID or non-COVID except have your protection get in place so that the healthcare workers and the health system also doesn't get compromised in the process. And uh, I think we need to have our antenna up and look out for these non-respiratory or beyond respiratory manifestations. Now we know that COVID is a system disease. So early recognition of these and management and follow up would be of you know tremendous importance. And please remember that managing such complications would remain according to the established protocols. There isn't much difference between COVID or non-COVID here, except being protected, both healthcare and the health system and the patients and the caregivers. Yes, sir, uh, your comments. Uh, um, I don't think there is much to add to what uh, Dr. Dutti and Dr. Padma have said, uh, but the only uh, other thing I would uh, say that uh, Non-COVID patients also we are realizing that care has gone down a bit and uh, we have to uh, pull up our sock and uh, be prepared to taking all safety measures, uh, be prepared to manage uh, these patients because we know, you know, uh, if we don't do that, like like we've seen the vaccine uh, vaccination program has gone down. So similarly, I, I would like to put on, on record that the uh, preventive cardiology or preventive uh, neurology in terms of uh, cardiovascular risk uh, reduction therapies have been slipping because patients may not come for their blood pressure control, diabetes control medicines because these are not conditions that give you acute uh, problems to stop these medicines. So we must make sure that we reach out through telemedicine to whatever means to patients so that uh, Preventive uh, measures are not uh, slackened because if that happens uh, uh, a year down the line, we may have an, another epidemic of cardiovascular diseases 
because of lack of uh, adequate preventive uh, therapies given at this time of time. So this is something which is not talked about so much and this is uh, something which uh, we need to take care of. Thank you, thank you very much and uh, any questions of course you can always mail it and uh, we will be happy to answer. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you and thank you to the Ministry uh, uh, for organizing this. Uh, Arvik and your team at uh, in the ministry to organize this uh, uh, this this episode of the uh, Central of Excellence program. And uh, as uh, Neeraj said, if there are any other questions, we'll be happy to take it on the WhatsApp group or on the uh, on or by me. Thank you so much.